Welcome, everyone, to Kansas Fest 2017. So Kansas Fest is about the Apple II, and this year's special because it is the 40th anniversary of the release of this landmark computer. It was the foundation of Apple's success as a company. In honor of this computer that's brought us all together, here's a condensed, I promise, history of the Apple II computer. <laughs> So 1976, the Apple I, Steve Wozniak created his own microprocessor-based video terminal using the newly available 6502 microprocessor as its brain. To make it simple to program, he wrote his own version of BASIC to run on it. At Steve Jobs' encouragement, the pair formed the Apple Computer Company to sell the circuit boards to let people build their own. A contract with the bike shop made the fully assembled Apple comu computers available, and it jump-started the company. 1977, the Apple II. Even before the company was officially created, Wozniak was working on a better version of his 6502 computer, one that had improved expandability and which would be ready to use right out of the box. To fully implement his vision for this computer, Woz needed help from additional people to create a switching power supply, a professional case, and some venture capital to have enough money to actually build it. The result was ready for demonstration at the first West Coast Computer Fair in April 1977. The first versions were available for sale as motherboard-only computers in May 1977 and as full systems in June. 1979, the Apple II Plus. Two years after the release of the original Integer Basic Apple II, the company had continued to offer improvements on the original model, including the Disk 2 drive, a floating point basic licensed from Microsoft, and peripheral cards. The result was the Apple II Plus with a full 48K RAM and improved ROM code. The company not only made it backward compatible with the original integer Apple II, it also released the AppleSoft firmware card bringing these new features to their original customers. 1983, the Apple II E. Apple was unsuccessful in creating a new product to replace the Apple II, which still continued to sell well and was carrying the company financially. They finally agreed to release an improved Apple II in January 1983, along with a radically different computer, the Lisa. The 2E took the features most often added to the Apple II Plus and made them standard, including a full upper and lowercase keyboard, 64K RAM, expandable to 128, and later that year, a next generation disk system, ProDOS, modeled after, after Apple III Sauce. Over the next decade, this became Apple's new cash cow and continued to fund their push into the next generation of computing. 1984, the Apple IIc. Though Apple CEO Steve Jobs had been focusing nearly all of his energies on the upcoming release of the Macintosh, he had some interest in a plan to recreate the Apple II as a closed appliance computer. The result was the Apple IIc, released in April 1984 at an event called Apple II Forever. This small powerhouse contained the equivalent of a 128K Apple IIe, two super serial cards, a disk controller, mouse controller, and a disk drive, and eventually a smart, a smart port capable of connecting larger capacity disk drives. Though it was never as popular as the 2E, it developed a loyal following. 1986, the Apple II GS. This brought 16-bit computing power to the Apple II while continuing to keep it backward compatible with its 10-year-old 8-bit heritage. It brought improvements to RAM, graphics, sound, and eventually also a modern, powerful, and adaptable operating system. 1987, the Apple IIe Platinum. Despite the availability of the 2GS, the Apple IIe continued to be a better seller. The economies of scale were brought to the Apple IIe, within, which included 128K of RAM, like the IIc, a full keyboard with numer numeric keypad, and a lower price than the previous IIe. In 1988, they had the Apple IIc Plus, which was an accelerated Apple IIc with a built-in 3.5-inch disk drive. Though it was the pinnacle of the 8-bit Apple II line, it was not as popular as its predecessors. 1989, the Apple IIgs ROM 3. This was the last hardware revision to the Apple II line that was sold, and like the Apple II Plus 10 years earlier, it included refinements that were not in the original 2GS. And just as happened with the II Plus, some of the new features in the ROM 3 were provided to older 2GS models through the magic of updates to the operating system. Now, during the last few years of Apple II updates, a small band of Apple II enthusiasts bucked the trend of coming out of Cupertino that claimed that the future was in the Macintosh. Back in 1984, former Soft Talk columnist Tom Weizar had started an eight-page monthly newsletter, Open Apple, later called A2 Central, which served as a technical resource. As colored print magazines for the Apple II began to see their sales decline, mirroring Apple's own negligence of the platform that was paying the rent. Weizar helped spearhead an Apple II-focused developers conference held for the first time in July 1989, just a month before the ROM 3 2GS was released. 
Its popularity resulted in becoming an annual summer event in Kansas City, the home of Resource Central, the company that Weizhart formed to manage his stable of Apple II and 2GS publications. Attendees gave the, na the event the unofficial name Kansas Fest. Unfortunately, Apple's decision to discontinue the Apple IIe line in November 93 accelerated the contraction of various businesses that served the Apple II community, including hardware, software, and publications. Despite all of his best efforts, Weizhart also had to close down Resource Central in January 1995. This did not, however, result in the end of Kansas Fest. Members of the Apple II Roundtable on Genie, which had also been managed by Resource Central, banded together and quickly threw, to get, threw to get, uh, together a three-day Kansas Fest, the seventh annual such meeting, in July 1995. The leaders who arranged this formed the committee, which has, with occasional changes in membership, continued to organize and run the event each year from then until the present day. Though in the first decade of the new millennium, there were some lean years in which fewer than 30 dedicated attendees came to Kansas Fest, the event has rebounded and has been growing annually. This year, with 100 registered participants, we have the largest attendance since 1994. Wow. And so again, welcome to Kansas Fest 2017. And I now want to turn it over to Kevin, or to Martin. Um, so, uh, we have had the very generous donation of a nice os oscilloscope, um, and we were kind of debating how to give that away. We decided to do a random drawing. Um, you know me and my D&D dice. Well, I forgot my D&D dice. Um, oh, wow. So I asked Google for a random number. Before I announce the winner, I would like to have the representative of the donor uh, come up and say a few words to you. Wow. This is Evan Cabrera. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, uh, Steve, a little correction about Apple II history. Hello. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is my first time at KFAS, so I'm being bold saying this. Um, it was, in fact, introduced at the West Coast Computer Fair in 77, but uh, the Atlantic City Personal Computer Conference in 76 Wass has said he had it ready in the hotel room upstairs, and Jobs said, no, 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 you can't bring it downstairs. You have to finish selling the Apple Ones first, trying to prevent what later became the Osborne effect. So it was ready to be demoed and available in 76 in New Jersey. But California got all the credit. <laughs> West Coast bias. <laughs> yes. um, so I run, a, I run a 501c3 nonprofit called Vintage Computer Federation. We formed a couple years ago from the, from the DNA of previous groups. Um, we run the Vintage Computer Forum, which has thousands of members worldwide about all kinds of computer history topics. We run the Vintage Computer Festival East, West. Um, East Coast shows in spring at our museum in New Jersey, the largest computer museum on the East Coast. We're a hands-on museum like LCM in Seattle. Uh, VCF West will be August 5th and 6th at the Computer History Museum in Mountain View. And two weeks ago, we announced VCF Pacific Northwest, the first one, at the Living Computer Museum in Seattle next February. Um, we also uh, we're, build, we're starting to build a hobby knowledge base. Hopefully, flesh it out over the next 12 months. And uh, anyway, we had a spare scope. We wanted to contribute something since you guys generally let me come here. So I hope somebody gets it and does something awesome with it. Uh, VCFed.org. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I rolled 50. Oh, sorry, one more. I apologize. I just want to point out one thing. I'm sorry. Um, in our trifold brochure, which you all got when you checked in, on the inside it says, seeing the early equipment at VCF is an amazing experience. It touches on all the hopes and dreams of the time and the many efforts to achieve what others thought would never happen. It brings back memories of revolution in the making. The people you meet at VCF are amazing. Steve Wozniak, Apple Computer. So the winner of the O-Scope is Anthony Martino. We'll, we'll find him. Jack in the box. Okay, we'll find him. <laughs> next person, pick next person. Anthony, you just won an oscilloscope. Yay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he can give it to someone else. See guys? Okay. Um, let's see. So I have a couple things to go over administrative details. One is lanyard colors. Uh, the staff are wearing black lanyards. Most attendees are wearing blue lanyards, which means it's okay with them to take their photo. Um, a few attendees are wearing red lanyards. That means it is absolutely not okay to take their photo. Um, not from behind, not from the side, not anything. So do be careful when you're taking pictures, uh, especially of large groups. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a campus alcohol policy. Alcohol is allowed in the rooms, but not in the public spaces. So just be aware of that. Um, and Kansas Fest has a code of conduct. Um, you know, the root of the code of conduct is we're all here to enjoy the apple too. We want everyone to feel comfortable. We want everyone to feel safe. We want everyone to feel, feel welcome. So I'm just gonna hit a few points of it. The full text is online. Okay, um, we're dedicated to providing a harassment-free con conference experience for everyone, regardless of gender, gender identity expression, sexual orientation, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, age, or religion. And we do not tolerate harassment of participants in any form. Uh, skipping ahead, um, things to stay away from. Verbal comments that reinforce social structures of domination. Uh, sexual images in public spaces, and uh, we need to have a little talk, somebody, in, on the first floor. Uh, deliberate intimidation, stalking, following, harassing photography or recording, sustained disruption or talks, uh, of talks or other events, inappropriate physical contact, unwelcome sexual attention. So, don't do those things. I, I don't think you would anyway, but just don't do those things. So, um, that is that policy. And I believe I am now passing it on. Oh, I, I have two other things to tell you. One is there's a newcomer's guide if you have not seen it. It's linked at the top of the Kansas Fest site. It's got an absolute megaton of information that will help you if you're a newcomer and you missed the orientation. Second thing is I am creating a photo roster with everybody's name and everybody's picture, <coughs> obviously, except the people who don't want their pictures taken. Um, so. I will be trying to find you to take your picture. If I don't find you to take your picture, find me and I will take your picture. Okay? Um, and that is on the kansasfest.org slash roster. Uh, and you can see it, you can find out the name of that person that you just met and immediately forgot their name like I always do. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dagan Brock to introduce our keynote. Oh yeah, uh, wear your badges, especially today. But oh yeah. Oh, badge. You want me to roll? You want to roll? Okay. We have more prizes to give away. I think everybody got a pin when they came Did, in. If you yeah, I just want to double check. Does everybody have one of the 2017 Kansas Fest pins that you put on your lapel? Any, or how about alternately? Could anybody not get one? That's probably okay. We just want to make sure we get this out before we get the one here. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> We're so organized. Lovely spokesmodel, Peter Navarre. Alternately, how about that garage giveaway? Uh, I know it's hard for a lot of you traveling, but I just want to reiterate, take as much as you can. There's a lot of great magazines and books still left up there. Tubs and tubs of cables. I'm surprised that you guys have not <laughs> run off with all of our rat's nest of cables. Okay, all right, I think we're good. Okay, everybody has a pin. Uh, Martin, do you want to discuss 
how this works. So, you probably just put your pin on your lanyard. You want to check the back of your pin. What's on the back of your pin? If it's got one dot, a, a black dot, you I get believe. an Apple logo hat. And, and, and an early iPad. iPad notebook with the Apple logo. And a water bottle. And, and an Apple branded water. water bottle. So check your pins. Anybody have a dot on the back of their pin? If you have a single dot. If you have two dots, you get... Oh, great. There's all three in the back corner. Just a random distribution, you guys. You get Apple IIc playing cards. Two dots. Two dots. And I'll take it away. So, yeah, why don't you guys walk around and... If you uh, have dots on your lapel badge, we're going to check you for Sharpies. And if you don't have one, we will give you a prize. Uh, and please keep your hand up. They're going to work their way around. And uh, as soon as we're getting close, I'll go ahead and get you guys one second. 